come your face is so red, Jake? You embarrassed about something? Yeah, I guess I am, Tech. Herb just called me down for starting to remove a torque flight unit too soon. Oh, didn't finish making all the tests, eh? Well, something like that. Maybe I had that boy out coming. What do you think? Me? Why drag me in? All I know is if I had a dollar for every torque flight unit that came out when it didn't have to, I'd be a mighty rich guy. I couldn't help overhearing that, Tech. And while that may be true, we'd better review what we know about torque flight, so none of us will take one out unnecessarily. Good idea, Herb. And let's start from scratch. Well, something basic is what I had in mind, Tech. It's easier to understand torque flight, for instance, when you look at it as a mechanical gearbox. Just remember that engine power is routed through planetary gear sets to provide torque multiplication for first gear, second gear, and reverse. The flow of power is controlled by two disc clutches and two bands. When these clutches and bands operate properly, the transmission works fine. But if a band slips or grabs or a clutch slips, operation won't be normal. Yeah, an operation not normal then becomes our baby, huh? Very true, Jake. But by looking for the one band or clutch that's at fault and isolating it, you simplify the problem, right? I get it. It's mainly a band or clutch track down. That's the one important thing to keep in mind, Jake. Then related checking will make more sense. Take oil level, for example. Clutches and bands are applied by hydraulic pressure. Unless oil level and pressures are right, the clutches and bands won't work properly. As a matter of fact, fellas, checking oil level should come before you make any other tests or adjustments. What's more, it must be checked properly. That's a good point, Tech. As all of us know, incorrect oil level can cause erratic shifting, especially when the unit is hot. And low oil level can lead to clutch failure. On the other hand, too much oil causes foaming, and that, in turn, leads to loss of pressure and erratic shifting. Now, you check oil level with the engine running at normal idle speed, don't you? Yeah, Jake, but first you'd set the handbrake and let the engine idle. Next, you operate all five push buttons slowly, returning to the neutral button each time. That gets all oil passages filled to operating capacity and then you check the level. Say, see that the dipstick cap isn't pushed above the stake point. If it is, you'll get a false reading. That's a good point, Tech. Now, if the car has been parked for a while and the oil feels cool, oil level should be at the low mark, plus or minus a quarter inch. But if the car has been driven about eight to 10 miles and the oil is thoroughly warmed up, oil level should be at the full mark or a half inch below. And when the car has been driven a long distance at high speed, the level might rise a quarter inch above the full mark. You follow that? Yep, clear enough, Herb. Now, anything else? Well, many cases of harsh shifting and clutch slippage during acceleration can be traced to a wrong throttle linkage adjustment. At any rate, we know that when the linkage is adjusted properly, the condition is often corrected. Uh, look at it this way. The amount of engine torque transmitted through the torque converter and into the transmission is directly related to throttle opening. In other words, the throttle linkage acts on the throttle valve so that throttle pressure increases in proportion to engine torque. That's why shift timing and quality are affected by throttle opening. If the throttle linkage is adjusted so that throttle pressure gets too high in relation to engine torque, there'll be rough, harsh shifts. If linkage is adjusted so that pressure is too low in relation to engine torque, apply pressure acting on bands and clutches will be too low. They'll slip, and the engine will race when the transmission shifts. I'm beginning to see why proper throttle linkage adjustment is important. It's one thing you must be sure about right after you check oil level, Jake. And remember, before you try to set throttle linkage, make sure that carburetor adjustment and engine idle speed are okay. Oh, you're so right, Tech. Now, here's how to check and correct throttle linkage adjustment when necessary. First, make sure the carburetor throttle lever is in idle position, off the fast idle cam. Then, disconnect the throttle rod from the throttle lever at the carburetor. Then, move the throttle rod rearward to the limit of its travel. There should be one half inch clearance between the bell crank and the dash panel. With bell crank in this position, the end of the throttle rod should line up with the carburetor throttle lever 
without moving the lever from the idle position. Now, if it doesn't, adjust the throttle rod length until you can connect it to the throttle lever without moving the lever or changing the one half inch clearance. Make sure that the bell crank lever is tight on its shaft. You can't get a good adjustment if you have lost motion anywhere in the linkage. If the bell crank clearance is wrong, leave the throttle rod disconnected. Make sure the engine is warmed up and the carburetor adjusted to give recommended idle speed. Loosen the throttle lever lock nut at the transmission. Have someone hold the bell crank lever so that the one half inch dimension is okay. While the bell crank is held, pull the transmission end of the throttle linkage as far forward as you can and tighten the lock nut to hold this adjustment. Then, with the bell crank lever to dash panel clearance right, adjust the length of the throttle rod so it can be connected to the carburetor throttle lever without moving the lever. Now, don't forget to check the accelerator pedal setting to see if you get a kick down without compressing the mat. You can adjust the length of the pedal to bell crank rod if necessary. Now, does that clear up the throttle linkage check? It does for me, Herb. Uh, can you clear up the push button cable adjustment too? Well, sure, Jake. The wrong cable adjustment has often been the cause of poor shift quality, engine runaway, and clutch slippage. Here are some reasons why that sometimes happens. In the transmission, regulated line pressure is directed primarily through the manual valve to the control valves. From the control valves, line pressure goes to the band servos and to the clutch apply pistons. The manual valve, remember, is positioned by the cable. So, if the manual valve is improperly positioned, flow of fluid through the valve will be reduced. In short, when the flow to the apply pistons is reduced, the transmission won't perform as it should. And that's why the cable adjustment must be checked before you even think about disassembling the unit. Very clear, Herb. You'll need a little help to adjust that cable, Jake. Just have somebody hold the R button all the way in. That removes free play at the button box. Then, loosen the screw holding the cable's adjustable bracket to the adapter housing. Remove the neutral starter switch and use a screwdriver to hold the manual valve lever in reverse detent position. Push the cable firmly into the housing and mark it. Pull it out all the way and mark it again. Put a mark midway between these two marks. Push the cable in until this mid mark is flush with the housing. Tighten the bracket screw to hold this adjustment. Reinstall the neutral starter switch, making sure it will make proper contact. If it's screwed in too far, it can affect the cable adjustment. Now, that winds up oil level, throttle linkage, and cable adjustments, the three most common causes of transmission malfunction. Let's talk next about Diagnosis. In just one minute, Herb. This needle's almost on dead center. Somebody ought to turn the record over for the other side of the torque flight story. When it comes to diagnosing torque flight malfunctions, a case of clear-cut failure to work is usually easy to figure out. But when you get a very general report that the customer doesn't like how the unit shifts, you may be in for a busy time. A lot of things can affect the quality of shift. Now, for example, if a band grabs, the shift is harsh. If a band or clutch slips, there'll be an engine runaway complaint. So it's important to know whether the bands and clutches are working properly. In fact, that's the whole key to torque flight diagnosis. And when you reduce the job to testing and correcting the things that affect a specific band or clutch, your job becomes a lot easier. I understand, Herb. Now, I want to know what comes after oil level, throttle linkage, and cable adjustments. I know those three things come first. Well, engine performance must be okay, Jake. Poor engine operation can affect shift quality as much as an improper linkage adjustment. All right. But suppose engine performance is good. Why, then you're ready to find out what's going on inside the transmission. So you road test. Check for kickdown band slippage first. Yeah, Jake. A kick-down band adjustment that's too wide can cause engine runaway on the 2-3 upshift and the 3-2 kickdown. To tell if the band is slipping, push button number two and increase road speed to 20 miles an hour. 
A transmission should then be in second gear with the kickdown band applied. You got that? Yep. Carry on. Okay. Now, accelerate quickly with three-quarter throttle opening to put a heavy load on the band. If car speed responds quickly without any engine runaway, the band isn't slipping. But if there is engine runaway, the kickdown band or the front clutch may be slipping. Both the band and clutch are applied when the unit's in second gear. How can I tell which one's doing the slipping? A front clutch test, Jake, with the engine idling and car standing still, engage the D button. The front clutch will engage. The rear clutch and both bands will be released. So only the front clutch can slip. Accelerate with three-quarter throttle. If car speed responds quickly without engine runaway, you'll know the front clutch is okay. Therefore, any slippage experienced during the kickdown band test came from kickdown band slippage. In that case, then, I'd check kickdown band adjustment, right? Yeah, Jake. You do that first. Right. And if the band adjustment is okay, and you know the cable adjustment is right, you'd check hydraulic pressures next. You'll find the pressure test details covered in this reference book. I get it. Now, suppose the kickdown band wasn't the one that was slipping. What you mean is the front clutch was the one that was slipping, and not the kickdown band. That would show up, of course, if car speed wouldn't respond quickly to throttle opening. Might even cause a squealing noise. When the front clutch slips, check hydraulic control pressures and recheck cable adjustment. If pressures in the cable adjustment were okay, remove the oil pan and check the seating of the ball in each detent position. You'd do this before any major disassembly, of course. Okay, Herb. I think I understand kick down and front clutch slippage. What's the next test? Well, you know that a kick down band that's too tight can cause a harsh 2 3 upshift and a harsh 3 2 kick down. So, check the 2 3 upshift at half throttle. The upshift should be very smooth if the band and throttle linkage adjustments are okay. At three quarter to full throttle, the upshift should be firm. It's normal for upshift to become more noticeable as throttle opening increases. Uh, it's a good idea to check the three two kick down at 35 and 45 miles an hour. Downshifts should be firm to sharp. When the two three upshift is noticeably harsh at half throttle, the kick down band is very likely too tight and in need of adjustment. I see. Now that takes care of the front clutch and the kick down band, but how about slippage at the rear clutch? That can be a toughie, Jake, but Herb can give you some mighty good suggestions. Well, if there's pronounced rear clutch slippage on heavy throttle acceleration while the transmission is upshifted in drive, the clutch pack is probably close to complete failure. Now to test for this, let the car coast down until you find the speed at which the 3-1 downshift is made. Now do this again, but just before it makes the downshift, accelerate rapidly with three-quarter throttle. If the engine races because engine speed increases faster than car speed, the rear clutch is slipping. Rear clutch slippage may be due to leakage and low hydraulic pressure that takes place only during the 2-3 upshift. Now, this may not show up when you check rear clutch pressure after the upshift. So, in a case like this, about all you can do when slippage occurs in the drive range is make sure the front clutch is okay. Also, make sure rear clutch pressure is okay before you disassemble the unit to locate and correct the cause of failure. I get the picture. If rear clutch slippage is obvious, the clutch is probably ruined. So you'd better correct the cause of failure before putting in a new clutch. That's the idea. Now, let's talk about the rear band, the low and reverse band. The rear clutch and the rear band are both applied when the unit is in reverse. If operation is okay in drive, but slips in reverse, the rear clutch is probably okay, but you should check the band adjustment. Suppose you find the band adjustment all right. Then you go to pressure checks, Jake. If all pressures check out okay, 
double check cable adjustments by removing the pan to make sure the ball seats properly in each detent. It ought to be plain by now, Jake, that it's easier to check pressure than to drain the unit and remove the valve body. Besides, if you don't check pressure first, you won't have any idea what to look for when you disassemble and inspect the parts. When you do check pressure, remember that the oil must be hot, 160 to 180 degrees. If the bottom of the oil pan feels hot, you can make your pressure checks. I'll keep it in mind, Tech. Frankly, I think I'm beginning to see the light. Proper oil level, throttle linkage, and push-button cable adjustments will correct most complaints. But if not, you road test to find out which clutch or band might be at fault. To determine why a band or clutch isn't acting right, you make a complete pressure check before taking anything apart. You're right on target, Jake. And remember, if your diagnosis shows band trouble, always check band adjustment before you begin any disassembly. Don't worry, Herb. I'll make every test that's necessary before I remove anything. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it, Jake. Tackle each torque flight job that way, and you'll always do right by the car and by its owner. Good advice, Herb. And just so nobody will forget, the complete torque flight testing story is in this reference book. Practice some of the checks right now. Then you'll be sure to follow all the tips and build up a bigger customer following. <laughs>